Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy calls us to trust Jesus. I think more people have found Jesus at the end of their rope than any other place in life. And you know what? When things are desperate, it's a call to go to God who's never desperate. Adrian Rogers said the Trinity never meets in emergency session. God's never desperate. He's working all things after the counsel of his own will. He's working all things together for good. When you're at the end of your rope, barely hanging on, Jesus doesn't ask you to figure it out because he's already figured it out. That's what we're learning today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. We're in the Gospel of Mark to meet some desperate people who come to Jesus for the solution only he can offer. Philip says it's an opportunity for our faith to be deepened and for God to do something great. It's a message Philip has called Trusting Jesus, That Is All, and it's part two. So let's join Philip as he begins with a story. A pastor was showing a ministerial friend around the church's newly opened facilities. And he took him from one ministry area to the next ministry area, from one room to the next room. And partway through the tour, his friend asked him what he considered the largest room in the church complex. The pastor's reply was classic. He said, the room for improvement. I like that. You see, when it comes to the Christian life, there's always room for improvement, room for maturing, room for developing, growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Hebrew writer says, let us go on to perfection. Peter says, let's add to our faith. There's always room for improvement in our walk with God, in our belief in Him, in our obedience to Him, in our looking like Him. I like what Spurgeon said to the students of his Bible college in London, mind you keep growing, brethren. Every one of you should feel that there's a bigger man inside of you. That's a great quote. And I think you'd agree with me, I certainly find that in my life, that one of those areas that is in need of constant improvement is the arena of faith the realm of trusting God. I think we all can say we believe, but with the man in the Gospels, Lord, help our unbelief. You see, the Bible talks about great faith and little faith. The Bible talks about strong faith and those who are weak in faith. The Bible talks about growing faith in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 3. Now, when it comes to to improvement, when it comes to maturing, when it comes to developing our relationship with God, one area that could do with greater improvement is our ability to trust Him, to trust Him more, to trust Him when it's not easy, to trust Him. And so I want to come back to Mark chapter 5, because here we find the story of a man by the name of Jairus whose faith in God was being stretched to new levels of dependence. We see this in verse 36. Do not be afraid, only believe. He had believed. That's what brought him to Jesus in the first place. His daughter was sick. She wasn't doing well. And so he demonstrated his faith in Christ by coming to Jesus about his sick daughter, despite the fact that he could be ostracized by the Jewish leadership in Galilee. But we see here that faith is not a single act. Faith must endure. Faith must grow. Faith must persevere. And so Christ calls Jarius to a greater expression of faith. He had gone to Jesus that Jesus might heal his daughter. Now he must believe in the possibility that Jesus could raise his daughter. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Keep on believing it's a present tense imperative. This man was asked by Jesus to keep on believing when it wasn't easy to believe. And so we want to be challenged by that. This story is a lesson in faith. Faith persevering in the face of delay. 
faith persevering in the face of hopelessness, faith persevering in the face of ridicule, and I'll show you that all a little later on. So let's pick up kind of where we left off. If you remember back, the first thing we noticed about this story was what I called the desperation involved. The desperation involved. We see in verse 23 that this man, a ruler of the synagogue, comes to Jesus and earnestly begs that he might come with him because his daughter lies at the point of death. This man goes to Jesus out of desperation. I want you to see that. In fact, this phrase, his daughter lies at the point of death, the word there gives us our word eschatology, which is the doctrine of the last things. You see, this little girl was in the final stages of her illness. Things were desperate. It was the 11th hour. Her life hung in the balance. I want you to just get that. And we saw that Jesus begins to go with this man to his home, verse 24. And we try to remind ourselves of something I think is quite beautiful, that despair is often the prelude to God's grace. Despair is often the prelude to God's grace. This man didn't come out of devotion to Christ. He came out of desperate need. He needed Christ to help him. He needed Christ to heal his daughter. And I encourage you to embrace this thought that when life brings us to a desperate place, we need to look up because it's a prelude to God's grace. We quoted the psalmist, this man cried to the Lord and the Lord saved him out of all of his troubles. He cried out of his troubles. His troubles pushed him to cry and God saved him. And when life presses upon us, it's really an invitation to go to Jesus. When life presses upon us, it's pushing us to the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the thing that strikes me is that Jesus shows himself strong in this desperate situation. In fact, there's a series of stories here that goes back to chapter four where everything is desperate. Let me just refresh you of the ground we've already covered. What about the desperation of the disciples. Lord, don't you care that we perish? Why? Because there was a mighty storm. There was a great wind. What about the man that Jesus meets in the region of the Gadarenes? A man who lives among the tombs. A man who is absolutely out of control. He's been indwelt by an unclean spirit. He lives among the graves of the graveyard. No one can bind them, not even chains. It's a pitiful picture because he cuts himself. This man's desperate. There's another desperate situation, and Jesus bids the demons leave him. We come to the woman with the issue of blood. She's got this continual internal hemorrhaging going on. Twelve years it has afflicted her. And she's spent all her money. She's gone to all kinds of doctors. She's tried all kinds of treatments, and she's out of options. It's another desperate situation, and Jesus heals her. And now we come to our story of Jairus and his daughter. And it's a desperate situation. It's desperate enough right here. When he goes to Jesus initially and says, Lord, would you come? My 12-year-old daughter, I love her so much. Would you come and put your healing hand upon her? But then the situation gets worse because Jesus delays his going to Jairus' house. He seems to get distracted with the healing of this woman, and her situation doesn't seem to be urgent. It's been there for 12 years. But there's a little 12-year-old girl whose life hangs in the balance, but Jesus pauses. And in the pause, the little girl dies, and the desperate situation becomes more desperate. I think I've hammered that nail hard enough. Desperate. You get it? But I like the thought of that, because life gets desperate sometimes, doesn't it? And we get desperate. I know many of your stories. I don't need to rehearse them from this pulpit. 
Some of you have gone through desperate challenges, health issues, marital issues, life circumstance issues. It's desperate. And you know what? When things are desperate, it's a call to go to God who's never desperate. Corey Ten Boom said, there's no panic in heaven, only plans. Adrian Rogers said, the Trinity never meets an emergency session. God's never desperate. He's working all things after the counsel of his own will. He's working all things together for good. And we need to remind ourselves of that, that our despair is often the prelude to grace and the wonderful display of God's love. I think more people have found Jesus at the end of their rope than any other place in life. When they've come to an end of themselves, when life has pressed them down and down and down, they make a beginning with Christ. That's why C.S. Lewis said that suffering is God's megaphone to rise a deaf world. Our desperation pushes us to Christ. It ought to. In fact, when I read a book on prayer by Jerry Sitzer, he said this, speaking of prayer, but it connects to the whole idea of trusting God. The heart of true prayer is this cry of desperation. There is a time and a place in the Christian faith to master the techniques of prayer, to develop the discipline of prayer, to become comfortable and confident when we pray. But what is more fundamental is the spirit of our prayers, the cry of the heart to get help from the only one who can meet that desperate and deepest need. Desperation is the first and primary condition for true prayer. The reason why we don't pray more, he says, and probably don't see more answers to prayer, is not because we don't know how to pray, but because we don't really need to pray. We're not desperate enough. Desperation is a good thing when it presses you and pushes you to the feet of the Lord Jesus. And when we were in London, we got to visit the war rooms that Churchill walked during the war beneath the streets of London. I'm a big Churchill fan, and so I probably find that to be the most enjoyable thing of the day we spent in London. And this whole idea of desperation, I was reminded of a conversation between Churchill and the Prime Minister of Ireland. One day they were talking about the difficulties their countries were going through, and Churchill said to the Prime Minister of Ireland, you know, in England, things are serious but not hopeless. To which the Prime Minister of Ireland replied, well, in Ireland, things are hopeless, but not serious. (laughs) Hopelessness is serious, isn't it? Boy, it's serious business when you're out of hope and desperate. But this would remind us to go to the Lord Jesus Christ. The problem with us sometimes is we're not desperate enough. We all give testimony to this fact. Our walk with God and our knowledge of God and our experience of God is often the richest when things are darkest. We saw not only the desperation involved, we secondly saw the diversion involved. Okay, the story begins in verse 22 with Jarius going to Jesus. We see in verse 24 that Jesus motions to go with him, I would assume, to his home to heal his daughter. And then in verse 25, we read, but a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and it suffered many things. This is what we have called an intercalation. It's the insertion of a story within a story. And we reminded ourselves when Mark does that, and he does it several times in his gospel, there are several purposes to it. It may be to make a contrast between the one story and the other story. It may be to reinforce a point and unify a theme, so it's kind of marked doubling down. But in some cases, and I think in this case, it's to raise tension. It's to add drama. I mean, things are desperate enough, as we have just said. But now they become more desperate because Jesus, it seems, gets diverted. And here you have a woman who's been struggling with a a bleeding issue, a hemorrhaging issue for 12 years. She's exhausted herself and her bank account seeking a remedy. And this man's got a 12-year-old daughter who may only have hours to live. And yet Jesus gives his attention to this woman, 
eventually heals her. But for Jarius, for Jarius, this is an agonizing delay. An agonizing delay. You can imagine his frustration while he's aware that his daughter is still alive, but on the doorstep of death. And to be frank about it, I think I can imagine his anger when the news come that she's dead. Why trouble the master any longer? And so we kind of drill down on that, and we reminded ourselves that God's delays are not God's denials. In fact, I was speaking to some several hundred pastors, and one of the other speakers was Jack Graham from Prestonwood Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, and I certainly enjoyed a friendship and a fellowship with him that day. But he said something in his sermon that struck me. He said, with us, time is everything, but with God, timing is everything. I like that. And it's true. And this is part of the story that would remind us that we need to give God time to fulfill his will in our lives, even when it gets darker and more desperate. And so we challenged ourselves to realize that when we find ourselves in the in-between of a promise God has made and the fulfillment of that promise, that that's an opportunity for faith to be deepened and it's an opportunity for God to do something greater. And that's what he's going to do in this story. Jesus will do something greater. He will raise this kid back to life. So that was the desperation involved, the diversion involved. Although, as I went back over that tax, and I didn't spend a lot of time in the story of the woman who had the flow of blood for 12 years. As I went back over that, I was struck by the phrase in verse 30. And I think it's worth a comment because this woman comes in an act of faith, touches the hem of Jesus' garment. She's healed of her affliction. But I want you to notice what verse 30 says. Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? The thought of strength, power, energy, leaving the Lord Jesus struck me. This act of mercy, this act of ministry, this healing depleted him, depleted him. And that's just a thought worth underscoring. Jesus became less so that she might become more. Her gain was Jesus' loss. Strength left him. Virtue left him. He gave of himself to her so that she could be made whole. And I think it's just a reminder, that's what ministry is. In service and ministry, if you're exhausted, well, it's par for the course. You can't serve without depleting yourself. Now, that's why it's important to get alone with God and fill your tank. That's why it's important to be in fellowship with God's people so that you feel energized and provoked to greater good works, according to Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. But do realize that ministry is exhausting and ministry is exacting. And we see it in the life and pattern of the Lord Jesus. In fact, we see it also, maybe most greatly expressed in the life of the apostle Paul. As I see the Lord Jesus Christ giving of himself, pouring himself out into this woman, I was reminded of what Paul says about his ministry among the Philippians in chapter 2 and verse 17. What does he say? He says, yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Can you make sense of that for me, pastor? I'll try. This is a letter to the Philippians. Paul is under house arrest. You're in Acts 28, verse 30 and 31, in terms of chronology. He's in Rome. He's under house arrest. He has now sent the letter through Epaphroditus back to the Philippians. He's glad to hear of their growth and their development, their service and sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's caught between this idea, I'd like to be with Christ, but to stay and minister to you and the other churches, if that's necessary, I'll embrace that. And anticipating that idea that he will continue to minister to them or 
that even his death might be a ministry to them and stirring them up and giving them a benchmark of faithfulness to follow. He takes an Old Testament image of the libation offering, the drink offering, and so if someone offered a sacrifice to God, sometimes the kind of, I'm putting it in my own words, the icing on the cake, the cherry on the icing is this libation offering where they would pour wine onto the sacrifice and it would evaporate and that would rise up to God like a sweet smelling offering. And Paul is saying, hey, your faith is like that sacrifice. I see you on the altar. I see you giving yourself to Christ. I just want to pour myself on top of that. What an image. I'm just going to pour myself out on you. That's New Testament ministry. Strength left the Lord Jesus. Paul poured himself out in the lives of others. I came across this idea in a book several years ago. There are two kinds of Christians, think Christians and faucet Christians. Here's the think Christian. Their idea is that they're a sink, and the water of salvation flows into that sink, and they soak up all the benefits, eternal life, the assurance of God's presence, his grace in times of trouble, his blessings, and every perfect and good gift that can come from above. They stand like this. This is their modus operandi. Lord, bless me. And there's nothing wrong with that. The Lord wants to bless us, but that can't be all that you are. And that can't be all that the Christian life's about. So there's the sink Christian, but then there's the faucet Christian. They see the world as the sink or the church as the sink, and they're the faucet and they want to pour themselves out into others who are lost and need the saving message of Jesus Christ, or they want to pour themselves out into Christians who need encouraged and blessed and served. Are you a sink Christian? Are you a faucet Christian? That's an important question Philip DeCourcy is asking here on Know the Truth. To hear this message again or to listen to any of the messages from the series Essential Jesus, There Is No Stopping It, go to our website at ktt.org. Today's message reminds us that every day we have a choice to make. We can choose to sink under the weight of our troubles or we can allow God to make us a faucet, pouring God's love and faithfulness into the world around us. It's so easy to default to fear when we focus on our situations, but when we keep our eyes on Jesus, our faith will be strengthened so that we can boldly proclaim the power of God's Word. And that's why Know the Truth is here. We want to help you keep your eyes on the truth of who God really is and what He's promised through His Word so that you can shine bright and draw others to Christ. Today, you can be a friend of the people you don't even know when you give to Know the Truth. Donate today to send the gospel out to listeners all over the world. Call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. And when you give today, we'll express our appreciation by sending you a timely book titled Gospel People, A Call for Evangelical Integrity by Michael Reeves. Today, when the term evangelical is mentioned, it brings about mixed feelings and even ruffles some feathers. Some Christians wonder if they should altogether abandon the term. Well, this book will help you understand the global, historical, and scriptural perspective of this relevant term and inspire you to reclaim its true biblical meaning. Request this eye-opening resource when you call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. You can also mail your donation to Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. And if you'd like to stay connected and up-to-date on all things Know the Truth, follow us on our social media pages. Just head over to Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, search for Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, and click like or follow. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd. Join us again when Philip returns to the Gospel of Mark. That's next time on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.